Well, thank you, Pastor Jody and HDC. It's great to have you a part of our service again today. Uh, you probably heard the good news already. We had 1,300 people for that first weekend of in-person services at our Victorville and Hesperia campuses. You probably already heard that in March, we're going to be able to reopen our other two campuses as well. And so all we're asking is that you remain prayerful. This is an evolving situation. We're excited about what God is, is opening up for High Desert Church to do, returning again to those old ministry rhythms that we've enjoyed for so many years together. And since this is all remaining so fluid, let's make sure that we download the HDC app, enable push notifications. And that way we can uh, all stay up to date, regularly reminded as to what is happening. And I know that you are praying with us. Uh, we are excited to take these steps as, uh, as we're rebuilding um, High Desert Church in those in-person, indoor experiences that we love and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future at one of those. The, the passage that we're looking at these days is from the book of Nehemiah. It's a series that we've entitled Rebuilding, and it's strategic. We wanted to learn from, from this story things that would help us better rebuild our own ministry rhythms again. The story of Nehemiah took place roughly 2,500 years ago. It was during a time in Israel's history known as the exile. Because of Israel's disobedience to God, God allowed the nation of Israel and then the nation of Judah to be dragged into captivity conquered first by the Assyrians and then by the Babylonians. And now, at this point in history, the Persians were taking their own place in ruling the civilized world. And it was during that time of Persian rule that God began to move in the heart of this man, Nehemiah, a devout Jew who had been born in exile. We learned something there, just that reality that God was going to move in the heart of a Persian king. Look at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. In the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels toward all who please him. You know, throughout the last 10 months, we've reminded you, political leaders cannot thwart God's purpose in history. Political leaders cannot change what God wants to accomplish in our lives. I mean, let's give God some credit here. God is still fulfilling His purpose for the world, no matter what the governments of the world decide. In this case, God moved in the heart of the Persian king. And many of Nehemiah's brethren had already been allowed to return to their homeland, to return back to Jerusalem out of exile. And when some of them circled back to Persia, they reported to Nehemiah that the walls and gates surrounding the city of Jerusalem still lie in ruins. Because of the love that Nehemiah had for that great city, because of the love that he had for God, his reputation was hanging in the balance. He had this passion that was from God to rebuild those walls, to reset those gates. He gave up an influential position in the Persian palace to put up all the hassles that go along with this kind of a mission. You thought your mission was the only one that had problems, the only one that faced obstacles. But, man, Nehemiah has given us a clinic on overcoming. By the time we get to chapter 4, we realize that the criticism of the locals toward this effort became Nehemiah's greatest challenge of all. A guy named Tobiah, a guy named Sanballat, a guy named Geshem. And those three residents of Jerusalem and the surrounding communities, they were very vocal when they declared to Nehemiah and his entourage that they had neither the authority or the ability to rebuild the wall. They said, Nehemiah, you don't have the authority to do this. There's no way you can pull this off. By the way, as we know, they were wrong on both counts. Nehemiah had both the authority, not just from the earthly king, Artaxerxes, but from the king of kings, his God. And God is able, which meant that Nehemiah would be able to fulfill that mission. 
But it's always good to be reminded that even in these, these biblical stories, that opposition seemed to always be there. There will always be people who don't understand our mission. They don't understand our motivation. They email, they blog, they otherwise find any audience they can in order to condemn or to criticize. That's always going to be a part of our experience as God's people. In chapter 4, verse 1, this is where we pick up the action this time. It says, when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry, greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Mocking them. He's mocking them. He's assuming they can't. Do they think they can do this? Do they think they'll ever be able to offer sacrifices again? Do they think they can finish this in a day? And they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, he chimed in. He said, what they are building, even a, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Again, criticizing Nehemiah, mocking his efforts. Just want to remind you, criticism is not the same as critique. So let's just draw a distinction between being critiqued and being criticized. See, critique has the goal of helping us become better people or helping to improve a particular situation that we're in to help us fulfill our God-given potential. Critique is part of life. In fact, it's a very healthy part of life. It flows out of the responsibility that we share within the Christian family as iron sharpens iron. And even though it can be hard to hear sometimes, it's important to take critique to heart. When somebody led by God's Spirit comes into our lives and speaks into our lives, we always need to ask God if there's something that we need to change about what we're thinking or what we're doing. But that's critique. A critical spirit is different. It springs out, not, not out of our responsibility to one another, it springs out of our personal insecurities. And sometimes the difference between those two concepts is really clear. I mean, you can identify immediately whether someone is trying to help you improve or someone is just trying to tear you down. Other times, though, it is hard to know. It's hard to Hard to know. We don't know people's motives. Is someone speaking into our context to honestly and humbly help us? Or are they trying to marginalize our efforts so they can feel better about themselves? Man, I don't know about you, HCC, but it's hard for me to even identify my own motives, let alone analyze somebody else's motives. But maybe the difference between criticism and critique is best identified by how our words make other people feel. A critical spirit is deflating. It keeps others from moving forward. It discourages people to the point where they want to throw in the towel and give up. And we all know those who seem to have perfected the art of criticism. They have this amazing, amazing ability to always pour cold water on things, find something wrong, no matter how, how wonderful a person or a situation might be overall, they're, they're always willing to point out the negatives, to point out what's wrong. I appreciated, read this years ago, but I appreciated John Stott, uh, a theologue from the last generation, but John Stott uses the word censorious to describe that critical spirit, and this is how he defines it. He says, and I'm quoting, the censorious person does not mean to assess people correctly, but rather to condemn them harshly. He or she is a fault finder who is negative and destructive toward others, puts the worst possible construction on other people's motives and is ungenerous toward their mistakes. To be censorious is to set oneself up as to claim the competence and authority to sit in judgment upon one's fellow man 
To be censorious is to try and play God, he says. End of quote. Suppose that's something that we all would love to do, play God, but none of us are very good at it. To buy and sand ballot were censorious people. Their agenda was self-focused. Their words were not intended to help Nehemiah become a better man or to help Nehemiah become a better leader. Walking away from conversations with those guys was a lot like you and I walking away from conversations with the censor- censorious people, the critical spirits in our, own, in our own worlds, in our own lives. We walk away from those discussions focusing on problems that became evidenced in the conversation. You can always identify a good leader. We walk away from conversations with good leaders not thinking about the problems, but thinking about the possibilities. And that's what happened with Nehemiah and his team. In verse 6, he says, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. People worked with all their heart. And then Samballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, the Ammonites, people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had moved forward. They continued. They'd gone ahead, and the gaps were starting to be closed in the wall. And now those critics became angry critics. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem, to stir up trouble against it. It's perhaps noteworthy to to remember that no physical attack ever came. Reminds me that fear is often the enemy's greatest weapon. And you know, fear is at the heart of terrorism. You know that, right? The actual attacks might be infrequent, but the thought that they could happen at any time And fearing that possibility, it just doesn't go away. The fear is always there. That's why they call it terrorism. You know, Satan is a terrorist. Satan accuses. He bullies. He intimidates. But he has no power to overwhelm us. He has no power to derail God's purpose in the world. And that's why he just lobs these discouragement grenades into our lives. And when he does that, we need to respond like Nehemiah did. Look at verse 9. But we prayed to our God. And we posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. I love that, HTC. Pray to God and post a guard. It's a good combo right there. In fact, Jesus actually told the disciples the same thing. Maybe you remember that encounter in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41 where he told the disciples, watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. It's one thing to pray that we won't fall into temptation. It's another thing to be careful with the way we live our lives. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The Spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Man, how many times do we quote the end of that verse? But there's always, watch this, there's always a personal responsibility in the quest to access spiritual power. We know that what we accomplish for God is accomplished by God. But there always seems to be that personal responsibility in there somewhere to just be careful. Down in verse 10, says, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out. We're getting tired. And there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. They were trying to rebuild without cleaning up the job site. You notice that? There's so much rubble, we can't rebuild the wall. And I get it. I get it, man. They were tired. They had worked so hard continuously. And when you're tired, it's tempting to want to to want to find shortcuts to get the job done. But you simply, and they learn this, you simply cannot build a wall on top of rubble. Man, there's a lot of spiritual lessons there. And some of you are trying to rebuild or build your Christian life without removing the rubble of your old habits. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, 
When, when you and I take that, that rubbish of our past to the dump, then it becomes easier to build a new life in Christ. Man, there's so much here that we can learn and uh, benefit from. It's like the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 12, verse 1, throw off everything that hinders. Get rid of the rubbish. Get rid of the sin that so easily entangles you, and then run with perseverance the race marked out for us. As Pastor Joel said last weekend, you have to face it if you want to fix it. So true, HDC. And look at verse 16. Now skipping down at Nehemiah 4.16. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spear shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah. Here we had this group of, of people in the construction trade, all working to build up that wall, and then we had the army standing there with them. See, prepared to defend. And the work continues to progress. Nehemiah is quite a guy. In fact, I read this a long time ago. I'll just share it with you again. But it's a quote that I've taken to heart. It says, you can measure the greatness of a person by what it takes to discourage us. And if that's true, then Nehemiah is a really great, he's a really great person. He gives us a clinic on how to overcome obstacles and get in the way of what God's trying to accomplish, both in our lives and through our lives. And we've talked about the passion. Remember that a few weeks ago? We talked about the passion. We talked about how that led to the prayers and, and how that kind of regenerated perspective and how that led to the development of the plans, the passion, the prayers, the perspective, the plans, and the next chapters that we're looking at right now. They highlight the importance of perseverance. It's another P word, <laughs> perseverance. In fact, you look at chapter 4 and chapter 6, they're all about opposition. Chapter 5, we'll consider that next time, but it's a parenthetical insert between chapter 4 and 6, and so we'll save that for later. But by the time we get to 6, the wall is essentially rebuilt, and they were just about ready to hang the gates, because when the gates of a city are put into place, that is when normalcy can return to the city of Jerusalem. That's when the people inside the city can feel safe. But before Nehemiah got that far, his team of, of builders and defenders encountered even more hostility from those critics. You know, when you and I encounter obstacles, it's, it's easy ourselves to become the critics, to be dragged down into their world. Oftentimes we choose to not take the high road anymore just because we're tired of all the stuff that we got to put up with. And we begin condemning others instead of just clarifying objectives. We all have to watch out for that. Those obstacles linger longer than we had thought. And at that point, it's easy to take our eye off the ball and focus on things that have nothing at all to do with our mission. We've even experienced that as a church. I know we all have. Over the last 10 months, it's been so easy to take our focus off of the gospel and to make other things the main thing. I'm sure Nehemiah would have loved to avoid all of these obstacles altogether, just like, just like you and I would. But obstacles do give us the chance to clarify our commitment to the mission. And I'm reminded again of what Pastor Joel said last week. We never grow in our comfort zone. And those obstacles push us out of our comfort zone, and now we have the opportunity to reassess. Now we have the opportunity to reconsider who we are. In fact, I... Put down in your notes, if you have your notes there, three questions to ask ourselves. In fact, these questions need to be answered before the mission begins. 
These questions need to be answered before the marriage begins, before the relationship begins, before you decide to become a parent. See, we got to answer certain questions before we engage the mission at all. Because the answers to these three questions tell us a lot about ourselves. Question number one, you can fill in the blank. How long will you persevere? God lays out the challenge and then we are asked the question. You ready to go to the wall for this? How long will you persevere before you are so tired of it that you'll just throw in the towel and say, I I just ain't doing this anymore. Question number two, who do you want to please in the process? You want to please yourself? You want to please other people? You want to please God? Who are you trying to please as you execute this mission? How long will you persevere and who are you trying to please? In Romans chapter 15 verse 1, The Apostle Paul said, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Why? Look at verse 3. Because even Jesus did not please himself. A self-pleasing life is is not a godly life. We're not, not in this for us. And then in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul continues, chapter 1, verse 10. He says, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see, that, that's, that's the litmus test for if we are servants of Jesus Christ. If the opinions of others change the way we choose to live. Hmm. Who are you in this to please? Even thinking back before a year ago, and uh, the gospel being the mission of High Desert Church, and the answer to question number one is, how long will you persevere? And we will persevere for as long as it takes. And who are you trying to please? We're trying to please God, who sent his son to die for us. Question number three is who, not who, excuse me, what, what should you prioritize? See, now, now that you've answered the first two, you're ready to go to the wall for something because you want to honor God. Now certain things become priorities in your life. Chapter 6, verse 1. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of the enemies that, that I had rebuilt the wall and had not left a gap in it. Though up to that time I had not yet set doors in the gates. The Sanballat, Cat, and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. (laughs) I love that that name, the plain of Ono. That'll tell you something right there. But they were scheming to harm me. And so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project, cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Verse 4. Four times, look at that, four times he sent me the same message. And each time I gave him the same answer. Listen up, you guys. When God gives you a mission, Satan immediately generates diversions. Sometimes in the form of sin, but more often simply in the form of lesser priorities. And you and I might look at that passage and think it would be harmless to get together with other civic leaders and have a conversation. But in this in this situation in this context it becomes potentially toxic for nehemiah and in some circumstances it might be a benign request hey let's get together and talk about what's going on but nehemiah's answer here could not be more direct he says sorry i'm too busy doing what god has asked me to do he doesn't beat around the bush man he doesn't say i'm sorry my wife isn't feeling well so i need to stick around the house Or something like that. It's just, sorry, I have better things to do than to talk to you. 
And that's not always a great answer. I know. But it can be. Because truth of the matter is, you don't have to agree to every invitation. You don't have to volunteer for every opportunity. You don't have to respond to everybody's call for help. And some of these innocent decisions that we make in our lives might not be as benign or as innocent as we might think. Some of these important activities in our lives might not be that important, actually. One of the Christian faith's most important disciplines is the willingness to say no. To say, no, I don't have the time. To say, no, I can't, afford, I can't afford to spend the money. See, life is full of choices. And quite frankly, you and I do not have the time to do everything or the money to buy everything. And that's the thing about life. It demands that we recognize our limitations. See, it's like being given a, a $5,000 gift certificate to the mall. I mean, if I gave you, if I sent you in the mail, a $5,000 gift certificate down to the Victor Valley Mall. You would think that was the coolest thing ever, right? You would think how generous, how nice, how excited you would be to spend it. But you'd still have to make choices because there are millions of dollars of inventory in that mall and you only have $5,000 to spend. See, that's what Satan does. He tells you, no, you got millions of dollars to spend. You don't have limitations. You can do it all. It's not true. That's why you need priorities. The digital world exposes us. This is going to surprise some of you. Exposes us to over 5,000 commercial messages per day. That's no joke, man. I, I, I rechecked. <laughs> those numbers. By the age of 20, we have been exposed to over 36 million commercials. See, if you're 20 years old right now, you have been exposed 36 million commercials, and every one of those commercials was designed to have you divert your time and resources to lower priorities than what God has extended to you, than the mission God has given you. These guys approached Nehemiah four times. And he wouldn't be distracted from what God had called him to do. See, God wants our convictions to guide us, not guilt to guide us. And if you don't understand your priorities, what they are, if, if you don't believe those priorities are more important than other things, then you will be sent on a variety of guilt trips You'll be guilted into diverging your time and your energy and your resources away from what God wants you to do to less important things. See, so here's a question. You might not, it's not one of those three questions, but it's interesting. You've probably never been asked this. Do fish know they're in water? You ever wondered about that? Probably not. Okay. Well, <laughs> I haven't asked any fish personally if they know if they're in water or not, but I'm going to guess they probably don't think about that. See, when you're immersed in something, it is precisely that something that is the most difficult for you to pull away from and analyze objectively. We've said over and over, over the years, it's an old Andy Stanley line, actually, time in erodes awareness of. The longer you're in a particular environment, the more used to it you become and the less capable you are of being objective in your analysis. And many of you have allowed yourselves to be distracted by so many other things for so long that you don't even remember what your priorities are supposed to be. These guys came to Nehemiah four times. And look at verse 5. Then the fifth time, Sam Ballot sent his aide to me with the same message, and, his hand was, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, 
It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you're building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There's a king in Judah. Now this report is going to get back to Artaxerxes. So come, they say for the fifth time, come, let us meet together. And I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you were saying is happening. Nehemiah is responding now. You're just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work, and it will not be completed. But I prayed, God, now strengthen my hands. I want you to notice something about the letter. It's unsealed. So anyone would have had the opportunity to read it along the way. It was obviously a calculated attempt to discredit Nehemiah by getting disinformation in front of as many people as possible. You may have noticed that there will always be an audience for people's criticism. And the more important your mission, the bigger target you will become. That's why your marriage is a target. It's an important mission. That's why your kids are big targets. Your mission to them is important. In fact, they frame your most important mission, your family. But you've got to love that. It's reported among the nations. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like this. <laughs> A lot of people are talking to me about this, and they agree with me. You ever heard that? Even Geshem says it's true. Now, remember in chapter 2, Geshem is the guy who was brought into this thing by Sambal and Tobiah. Geshem is the stooge. I mean, so what if, Geshem, if even Geshem did say it was true? He was part of the problem, not part of the solution. Yeah, critics, critics will always try to puff up their opinions by claiming they have this enormous following. And I will be the first one to say, if there's something wrong with how we're thinking or what we're doing or how I'm living my life, I want to know it. If there's a report, I want to see it. If there are a lot of people who agree about that, then let's get them all together and let's talk about everybody's concerns. Critics try to puff up their opinions by claiming they have this huge following. Even Geshem says it's true. And we've heard from all... All the nations, right? Look at verse 10, chapter 6. It's starting to wind down here. One day, Nehemiah says, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of Mehet table, who was shut in at his home. This guy, Shemaiah, is a shut in. And, uh, and he said, let's meet in the house of God inside the temple, close the temple doors, because men are coming to kill you. By night, they're coming to kill you. And I said... Nehemiah says back to this Shemaiah, he says, should a man like me run away? Is that what you're suggesting? Should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? He said, I'm not going to do that. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He'd been hired to intimidate me, so I'd commit a sin by doing this, and then they'd give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah, verse 14, remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, now he's praying. Remember those two guys because of what they have done. Remember also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who have been trying to intimidate me. Back to Shemaiah for a minute. <laughs> Nehemiah, man, he couldn't even get a retired prophet to give him props. And we don't know that much about Shemaiah except that he's a stay-at-home prophet. He's a shut-in. He's probably very old. He may have been a great prophet in his day. If that hadn't been the case, Nehemiah probably wouldn't have agreed to speak with him. He probably had had in his life this reputation in the community for, for spiritual wisdom and leadership. But it was clear that Sanballat and Tobiah had convinced Shemaiah that Nehemiah was dangerous. And now look at what Sam Ballot and Tobiah are trying to do. They're trying to leverage an old man. It's funny how some things never change. You hear all the time about how people try to scam the elderly. 
That's what these guys are doing to get at Nehemiah. And you got to remember, Nehemiah is not a priest. Nehemiah is a political leader. According to Jewish law, he was not allowed to go into the temple. In fact, the wording there indicates the holy place, the inner part of the temple. Gentiles would go into their temples all the time for sanctuary, but the Jewish people were not allowed that option. They had cities of refuge for that, but not the temple. You know what would have happened had Nehemiah gone into the temple, into the holy place, to save his own life? He would have violated the law and been discredited in the eyes of the Jewish people. Do you not think that Sanballat and Tobiah, now Shemaiah being played by these two guys, they all knew that. Nehemiah's life may have been saved, but the mission God gave him would have been over. Jewish people would have lost their respect for him. Yeah, it's all a ploy. And let me just remind you again, HDC, God, God's will for your life will never involve a violation of Scripture. It's never right to do wrong to do right. Fill in those blanks. It'll never be the right decision to disobey God so that something good will result. The Scriptures were that authoritative to Nehemiah, he would not go into the temple. And you may have noticed over the past 10 months, if you didn't already know it, but the Bible is that authoritative to us too. That Bible is that authoritative to me. And I'll persevere until I die to defend the veracity of the Word of God. That's how long I will persevere. And it is the Word of God that I will go to the wall for, not the opinions of people. I will never make decisions to make you happy. <laughs> I don't even make decisions to make me happy. If I'd have made decisions to make me happy over the last 10 months, we would have kept these in-person services going the entire time. When Nehemiah said, should a man like me run away, he wasn't challenging them. He wasn't saying, come on, come on. <laughs> you want a piece of me? This was a reflection of his humility, not his pride. This is a reflection of his complete submission to the will of God in his life. This is a reflection of him understanding that he is right where he needs to be, right in the center of God's will, obedient to God's word, safely covered by God's protective care. When you choose to disobey God because you think that if you do disobey God, something godly will result, When you do that, you're saying God was wrong when he wrote the Bible. I don't know about you, I'm not ready to say that. All I got to say is you better be right if you take that posture. Because if you and God disagree, you can't both be right. And if I'm presented with a choice to either please you or please God, let me just say you should be prepared for disappointment. <laughs> and look what happens in verse 15. Nehemiah 6.15. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. 52 days. In verse 16, when all our enemies heard about this, all surrounding nations were afraid. They lost their confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. All along this incredible journey. Nehemiah probably thought that the obstacle du jour, the obstacle of the day, would be the greatest he would have to face. Man, if I can only get the king to get on board, the rest will be easy. We're going to need a lot of building materials. If we can only get them, it'll be downhill from there. And then he gets to Jerusalem and he sees the mess. This is going to take a Herculean effort by a whole bunch of Herculeses, but if we can get the right team together, oh yeah, we just need the right team. And then the critics start chirping. Who are these guys? I can't believe anybody can be such a pain if we could just dispense with them. In fact, you notice Nehemiah asked God to dispense with them. But each step along the way, Nehemiah persevered. And when he persevered, God provided. God provided the wisdom and the energy to take the next step on the journey. 
Every time he took another step, he had to be absolutely exhausted, but he would not stop. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. Oh yeah, the last year has been very tiresome. It's been exhausting. But at the proper time, God promises, we will reap a harvest if we don't what? Don't give up. For Nehemiah, the proper time was 52 days. In 52 days, God used Nehemiah to rebuild what had been broken for 141 years. And he succeeded for one reason. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 8, he recognized it. He recognized it early on because of the gracious hand of God. God gave him the passion. God provided the resources. God brought together the people to provide the skills to complete the project. God discredited the critics, and God put down the rebellion. Now do you understand why I always say you need to place your life in His hands? In the gracious hands of God. HTC, I hope you'll hang in. Resolution is coming. And Father, I pray that you would give us that sense of hope a spirit of joy, even before the resolution arrives. Would we be that joyful because we know it will arrive at some point because that's the kind of God you are. And for those men and women, those young people who are watching today, people from all over the world who are listening to the words from the book of Nehemiah today, would we recognize that resolution is coming for us. It's coming for them and would we remain faithful? Lord, would we persevere? Would we live to please you? Would we live out the right priorities and uh, honor you with the mission you've called us to fulfill? And if you're watching today and you don't know Christ, and, and this story reminds us that uh, life is beyond us. We just can't, we can't do it on our own. And God in his uh, eternal love, he sent his son to save you from your uh, insufficient efforts to save yourself. You can't. If you'll admit that you're a sinner and you can't do it on your own, if you'll believe that Jesus was sent by the Father, the Son sent by the Father to save you, to save you from you, from your sin, and then to choose to place your faith in him. Listen, my friend, if, you were, if this was the attitude of your heart, the prayer of your heart, you could say this right now, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus is the Savior, and I just place my faith in his very capable, gracious hands today. And Lord, we give you the week. It's going to be a great week, we believe, because we are living our lives out in those very capable, very gracious hands of yours. And uh, we thank you in Jesus' great name. All God's children said, amen.